Some decades ago, I presented a clinic on jazz to a group of high school students. With about two minutes left on the clock, I said there was time for one more question. A student raised his hand and said, I've been listening to John Coltrane, but I don't think I understand everything he plays, and I'm wondering if you can explain it. Well, I laughed, and I said, I don't think anyone is going to explain John Coltrane in two minutes, and if I had two years, I still couldn't do it, because Coltrane existed on a level that is beyond my, or frankly, most musicians' comprehension. To be fair, Coltrane struggled somewhat to explain himself, although not for lack of trying, in dozens of interviews. For most of his relatively short professional life, he was driven to spend every waking minute, and probably some sleeping ones, on a quest to make his music a means to a higher end. John Coltrane was born in 1926 in Hamlet, North Carolina. Both his grandfathers were ministers, so religion was a part of his upbringing for sure. When his father and his grandparents died within a short time of each other, he and his mother moved to Philadelphia to live with an aunt. She recalls him sitting at the table practicing, saying, We just learned to move around him. She also attributed his later success, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, to having been raised by women. Coltrane played clarinet and alto horn as a child, and he took up the alto sax in high school. To avoid being drafted into the Army during World War II, Coltrane enlisted in the Navy on August 6, 1945. That was the same day that the U.S. dropped the world's first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which might have caused a new serviceman to question his decision. The nuclear attack effectively ended the war, which created an opportunity for Train to play with the band at his Navy base in Hawaii. In this clip from 1946, we hear him playing Cherokee on alto sax. The influence of Charlie Parker is evident, both in the vocabulary and the choice of tune, which Bird had played on his debut record a year before. In 1960, Coltrane said, The first time I heard Bird play, it hit me right between the eyes. He did all the things I would like to do and more. He could do things melodiously so that anybody could hear. That's what I haven't reached. <laughs> After his discharge from the Navy, Train moved back to Philadelphia, where there was a strong local jazz scene, including the Heath brothers, Jimmy, Percy, and Tootie. In Jimmy's telling, Coltrane practiced nearly continuously, something for which he was famous throughout his life. And, and when we were in a hotel in uh, San Francisco, and Train was practicing in the hotel, of course, in his room. And somebody calls on him, hey, tell that guy to stop all that noise with that music. That saxophone up there. The train took the horn out of his mouth and practiced fingering for an hour. <laughs> I'm watching Willie Mays. <laughs> I'm watching sports. I asked train one time, I said, man, Tr Willie Mays hit three home runs today, man. He said, who's Willie Mays, Jim? <laughs> he wasn't into sports, man. He let that go. He was into a mission of practicing and music every day, all day. In 1955, Coltrane got the call from Miles Davis to join what became known as Miles' first great quintet. As Miles was a rising star at that point, that gig provided Train with a substantial amount of exposure and the freedom to develop his own style. So it was a big blow and a wake-up call when Miles had to fire Train in 1957 as he had become unreliable due to heroin and alcohol abuse. As Miles had done a few years earlier, Train went home to kick his drug habit. In the liner notes for A Love Supreme years later, Train credited a religious epiphany with giving him the strength to do it and imbuing his life with a sense of purpose. He wrote, I experienced by the grace of God a spiritual awakening which was to lead me to a more productive life. In gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privilege to make others happy through music. Train returned to New York to record his debut album in mid-1957. It's hard to fathom that Train's entire career as a leader took place in a 10-year period before his untimely death in 1967. 
Also in 1957, Train worked as a sideman with Thelonious Monk. Only a few recordings were known to exist of that group, so it was a major discovery in 2005 when a tape was found in the Library of Congress, almost 50 years later, of a Carnegie Hall concert in 1957. It was described by one critic as the musical equivalent of finding another Mount Everest. The tape was remastered and released by producer Michael Cascuna and Monk's son, T.S.,
In 1958, Train rejoined Miles for the album Milestones. The same year, he recorded his own albums, Blue Train and Soul Train, which he mentioned as his personal favorites, and a lot of people would agree with that. In the liner notes for Soul Train, Ira Gittler coined the term sheets of sound to describe Coltrane's voluminous outpouring of notes in solos that could sometimes go on for 15 or 20 minutes. When Miles asked him to play shorter solos, Train said, I don't know how to stop. Miles replied, Try taking the horn out of your mouth. In interviews, Train acknowledged that he hadn't yet found the essence of what he was trying to say, which led him to essentially play everything in search of it. He said, It does me a lot of good to play until I don't feel like playing anymore, but it has made me think that if I'm going to take an hour to say something that I can say in 10 minutes, maybe I'd better say it in 10 minutes. I found out that I don't say that much more. In 1959, Train recorded his seminal album, Giant Steps, at almost exactly the same time that he was recording Kind of Blue with Miles. These two albums are a big part of the reason why 1959 is considered to be such a monumental year in jazz. While Giant Steps is noted mostly for the harmonic progression in the title tune and others that's become known as the Coltrane Matrix, the album also contains the ballad Naima, which was the middle name of Train's first wife. He described it as his favorite composition. The harmonic form of Giant Steps, the Coltrane Matrix, is based on rapid modulations of a major third. It was a challenge for pianist Tommy Flanagan, who had to contend with it on the original record, as it has been for aspirational jazz musicians ever since. 